Welcome all to the 119th session of the weekly huddle. I'm your host, Anu Pagrawal. I am a cardiologist working at uh, Kim's Hospital, Secunderabad. Uh, typically, I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Praneet. He is not here with us right now. Hopefully, if his case gets done sooner, he will join us uh, following. Most of you are quite familiar with the huddle uh, format. It is an unscripted audience level interaction where we address common clinical scenarios that we encounter in our daily clinical practice. We took about six weeks break recently where we tried to figure out uh, ways that we can restructure our program, which makes it more meaningful for our attendees to, uh, to join. And with that, now I'm trying to include uh, topics which are a little bit more expert in nature uh, rather than being more general. And uh, uh, I'm trying to have at least one expert in our discussion who can lead our uh, thoughts uh, while we uh, while we share our own ideas. So um, to my attendees, just because we have Dr. Pratik here uh, with us, please do not shy away from sharing your thought process in terms of how you typically handle these kind of cases. And this will be my request for even future sessions uh, where we do have an expert present, but the whole premise of the hurdle is uh, all the attendees who are taking part, they should be able to share their thoughts, their practice patterns, their understanding of how they do things, because I'm pretty sure whatever is written in the book or in the guidelines, a lot of times we are not able to follow either because it is not tailored to our particular patient population, or there are other pragmatic reasons why we are not able to follow this. So with this background, I'm going to start the clinical case. And then uh, Pratik, sir, I will start with you only if I will ask uh, your opinion uh, one by one. Uh, and then uh, uh, in between, I'll take a few seconds pause in case if any of the attendees have any thoughts or questions or comments. So this is a case which uh, I actually discussed with Pratik sir a few weeks back. So I just brought this question over here. So it's a 23 year old male. He just to give you a background history, he had a cardiac arrest about six years back while he was playing basketball. Uh, he was resuscitated on the field. Uh, he was taken to the hospital where uh, with critical care support, uh, he made a reasonable recovery. He was diagnosed of having anomalous left main coronary artery, which had a malignant course. Uh, following recovery, he underwent uh, bypass surgery plus an ICD implantation because of his arrest. Uh, he now is mostly recovered and uh, he is doing his daily activities without any major problem. So uh, I'm on a video consultation with him. He's complaining that for the past few days, he had fever, myalgia, lethargy. He thinks it symptoms started about three, four days ago. Now the fever is still present. It's a low grade fever now. Earlier it was high grade fever, but there is extreme weakness, extreme prostration. He's not able to uh, do his daily activity because of that weakness. Uh, he is able to uh, eat a little bit. He's able to uh, keep uh, oral intake. He's not throwing up. So the dominating symptoms now are mostly weakness and pain. Uh, and just, just overall uh, prostration. So he doesn't have any other localizing signs that might point towards one, one infection source or the other. He stays outside Hyderabad, and that is how I'm doing a video consultation on him. He is basically seeking second opinion to ask what he should do other than taking paracetamol. That's the only thing he's taking. Uh, and uh, also uh, he's asking whether he should get admitted to the hospital now, whether he should wait for uh, more things to be done and whatnot. So I uh, sent some basic uh, lab investigations on him. <clears throat> I'm just uh, walking you through the lab investigations. Of course, I can't tell you physical exam findings because I'm on a video consultation with him. So the labs are as follows, his hemogram, and I've shared all of that on the WhatsApp group. Uh, if you want to refer to that, you can quickly look into the WhatsApp group. All the labs are posted there. So his hemoglobin is fine. His TLC is actually lower, 1,730, with absolute neutrophil count of 1,100. His uh, platelet counts are 1,30,000. Renal profile mostly is okay. His creatinine is 1. 
His liver profile suggests slightly elevated AST ALT with uh, AST being 111 and AST being 70. His total bilirubin protein and other liver profile parameters are normal. <laughs> his dengue NS1 antigen is positive. And amongst the serology, his dengue IgM is positive and IgG is negative. So with this, I was pretty confident that uh, I'm dealing with uh, a dengue fever here. And now I have to uh, just add all these uh, lab parameters and his clinical presentation to make up uh, my clinical decision, what I should do for this patient. Now I'm a cardiologist, so I of course don't have that confidence to make this decision. So that is where I called Pratik sir for his opinion. And I thought we are currently in this uh, endemicity of uh, dengue fever. I'm pretty sure each one of our attendees they know somebody either as a patient or as somebody who is known to them in the last two, three months who had uh, dengue fever. So it is it is all over us. And uh, I thought it was very practical for us to discuss the dengue at this time. So uh, the questions that we are going to uh, refer to for today's discussion are dengue serotypes. So how, how is it relevant to us? Do we need to check for dengue serotypes? How do we clinically classify dengue fever, particularly in this kind of patient subset where we can identify who will benefit from uh, early admission? What would constitute a significant bleeding? Because as you all know that dengue, we are uh, worried about uh, thrombocytopenia and bleeding. And then we'll talk about when to transfuse, what to transfuse and all this. We will also try to infer what these labs value mean and how to interpret that. Uh, what kind of fluids we are going to give and all those things. So we are going to refer a lot of these aspects in the most practical way, way possible. So uh, Pratik sir, I will uh, start with the very first question and uh, you can take time to answer those because I don't want to rush it. I want my attendees to, uh, to assimilate uh, the information and uh, come up with their own thoughts and come up with their own questions. So we can, we can take time to go through it. So first of all, with the presentation and with the labs that I gave you, uh, that I shared with you, uh, am I on the correct track? Have I made the diagnosis of dengue yet? Or do you think there is still more for me to explore? Um, yeah, before we venture into the further discussions, I just forgot about two, three initial CBC values. So what was the hemoglobin PCV, the platelet count, and the heme, I think the white cell count, you said 1,700 odd value. So the this uh, platelet count and the HBPCV, can you uh, tell me that again? Right. So hemoglobin is 13.8. Mm -hmm. PC, 13.8, you got that? Right. Yeah. Right, right. P, P, PCV is 48. All right. TL, TLC, 1,730. Okay. And platelet count, 1,30,000. All right, fine. So I think, uh, thank you for that information again. So basically, we have a viral prodrome with significant myalgia prostration, and you have dengue NS1 positive. This is around day three to day four of symptoms. And this is the time in first three to four days, you would usually get NS1 positivity. And around three to five days or six days is when you get IgM positivity. In the given case, you have both positivity. So definitely, this is dengue. There is no, di uh, no uh, dilemma in the diagnosis. It's a definite dengue. Now, when we approach the further situations, so in the classification of dengue, let's say that's the how to approach it. So whether it's a, a dengue, simple dengue, it's a dengue without warning signs, what we in the current classification. So this is the recent uh, WHO classification, which is 2009, if I'm uh, not uh, uh, wrong, I think. So this is a recent classification, which was like when we studied MBBS, probably then that was the dengue with dengue hemorrhagic shock and dengue shock syndrome. That was the uh, classification of dengue, previous classification. But the re this one is dengue without warning signs, you can say a stable dengue. And then there is a dengue with warning signs. And then there is a severe dengue. These are the three broad categories of dengue overall. So we need to see which category the given patient fits in. So like in this case, if he is relatively all right and he has a relatively good intake, he's able to take good amount of food and water, 
and he is passing urine that means he is likely to be in a dengue with sorry without any warning signs and there are uh, another thing that we need to know is what is the phase of dengue uh, illness normally you can have three different phases of infection in the dengue you have a febrile phase you have critical phase and then you have recovery phase so critical phase is not seen in uh, all cases only in some cases you see critical phase febrile phase is obviously the name itself is explanatory when there is a fever however in some cases there is a critical phase where there is a lot of plasma leakage or capillary leakage which leads to the third space loss of fluids which can lead to the signs of let's say warning signs or a uh, severe uh, severe dengue manifestations so this is seen only in few cases and these are the cases which are we should be worried when we are managing cases so that critical phase of the disease or patients with warning signs and severe dengue is to be admitted and closely monitored and treated appropriately and then comes the recovery phase so why we need to see that is because your manifestations of dengue change the way how you approach changes so that's why these are the few things which we need to assess when we see any patient of dengue so thank you so much for that introduction uh, i will i will keep working on the questions uh, and uh, we will keep taking your your opinion uh, the who classification that you are talking about i have shared that uh, as a picture so uh, each one of you, if you want to just uh, review it on your screen, you may be able to take a screenshot or save it uh, for your reference. This is what uh, Pratik sir is referring to about. Uh, Pratik sir, my second question to you is one you mentioned about the diagnosis and uh, the identifying these. Is it is it the, the clinical classification that we are using currently and we have abandoned the dengue, dengue hemorrhagic shock and all those kind of things have we completely abandoned? This is the clinical uh, utility that we are doing currently. See, most of the uh, places we have switched from the old classification, we usually stick to the same classification. Now, what we just mentioned, the recent one. However, still we see some people using the old classification, dengue with uh, uh, dengue hemorrhagic shock. So it's just using a different nomenclature. Uh, mm -hmm. That's it. But still, uh, sometimes we do see the old classification being used. Then, sir, we will move on to the next uh, question uh, for the dengue infection. You mentioned about uh, serotypes when I was talking to you. What is the clinical relevance of serotype? Is it something that we should be checking? We should be bothered, or is it only for epidemiology? uh there are implications so uh, as we know there are four serotypes of dengue so mm -hmm. there is a very minor cross reactivity or cross immunity among these viruses so one infection with one type of serotype does not give you protection against other types so practically we can have dengue at least four times in our lifetime a person can still have four times and after the first infection, any second infection, if you get, that is likely to be a serious infection because it uh, stimulates the immunity more. So the, any secondary dengue, as we call it, can have a severe manifestations. That's why we need to be careful in managing those patients. Anybody who had history of dengue or if... Pratik, sir, we lost you now. Am I audible again? Yes, you are. Yeah, okay. So that's one. That's why we need to know. However, we don't need to know which serotype infection I had or somebody had in the past. So that one, two, three, four doesn't ma matter in the clinical management. So whether it's just IgG positive or not, that only helps it. So we don't need to know particular serotype in the routine clinical management. However, it may uh, help us in uh, vaccine scenario. Let's say there is a dengue vaccine which has been approved by WHO in some countries, especially Mexico and some Southern American countries. It has been approved uh, and is being used. However, in India, it's not been approved for reasons because it doesn't give you the protection against all serotypes. 
so uh, we need to know the background and it is not effective against certain stereotypes like i think two and three it is not very useful against stereotype one and four it is more useful so that is the reason but in clinical management of active patients with uh, infection of dengue it is not useful thank you sir then we will go towards back to your clinical uh, classification because my next question is pertaining to that I told you the clinical scenario of this patient. I told you the labs that were available to me, and you you have shared uh, the WHO classification that we are using right now. Are you deciding whether yes. which patient should get what kind of treatment based upon this classification? Can you fit my patient into this particular classification and decide whether you want to treat him at home or you want to treat him in the hospital? Yes, that's the reason why the WHO classification has been changed. This is more clinical oriented classification, you can say. So if the patient is not a high risk or if he does not have any warning signs, then probably you can just watch the patient at home, ask him to take plenty of oral fluids and symptomatic treatment like a paracetamol or any antacid or anti-emetic. That should be fine. And explain him what are the warning signs if at all he manifests any of those signs to uh, come back to the hospital so that we need to admit him. So that is the exact intention why these are the uh, classifications made more clinical than the uh, previous classification. Let's say in your case, the patient did not have any uh, warning signs, which are easily like if he's not able to eat, if he's too lethargic, if he's vomiting out too much, his uh, output is not much good. If he's extremely lethargic or restless, extreme lethargic means uh, he's not able to get up, he's not able to eat anything. That is what I'm saying, extreme lethargy as such. Or if there is any abdominal pain or distension, that can be a sign of third spacing or accumulation of fluid in the abdomen or any uh, uh, respiratory distress, which can happen due to the pleural effusions. So these are the things which we need to explain to them so that if there is anything new, they can come back. And obviously the mucosal bleedings, like if there is any bleeding from the nose or if there is any gum bleed uh, or any uh, hematuria or any uh, blood in the stools. So these are all things we need to explain to the patients. And if they don't have any of these, they can remain at home and uh, just uh, watch for these symptoms, take adequate oral intake. So that oral intake has to be really stressed upon liquids uh, around three to four liters, depending on the weight and the overall ha body habitus. That has to be emphasized and uh, we can uh, monitor it further. So uh, I'm reading these warning signs which are there on uh, the page that I have shared. It says abdominal pain or tenderness, persistent vomiting, clinical fluid accumulation, mucosal bleed, lethargy, restlessness, liver enlargement more than two centimeters, and then lab value of increase in hematocrit concurrent with rapid decrease in platelet count. Pratik sir, I'm going to ask you these definitions for the laboratory, but before that, you mentioned bleeding episode. Few of the bleeding episode you mentioned, mm -hmm. mucosal bleed and all this. Uh, Tell us what is this mucosal bleed? A, a patient who has, let's say, this boy, he's brushing his teeth and he got some bleed from his gum. Is that is that mucosal bleed requiring admission? Uh, uh, see, I would uh, say that the mucosal bleed, like I said, it it can be gum bleed as well. In this case, what we need to do is just check the platelet count and the routine CBC. If it is brushing too hard or somebody who has a history of gum bleed, it may not be significant. If he has somebody has gingivitis or carious tooth, they may not be uh, having a this may not be a significant event. However, somebody who never had such issue but has a new onset epistaxis or even gum bleed, even on very soft brushing, probably it's an early sign. So that way you have to see the whole picture rather than just one uh, finding. Same way, uh, especially uh, in women. Like what we say, the menstrual uh, bleeding. If it is uh, expected menses, and if it is not heavier than usual, it's not to be supposed as a uh, bleeding manifestation. However, if there is any excessive flow, or if it's not expected uh, on the due date, and if it comes early and it's abnormal bleeding, then it has to be considered significant. Then the question is, again, going to the bleeding part also, how about skin rash? So, uh, is it subcutaneous rash? Is it part of bleeding manifestation? Uh, no. 
how when we talk about this uh, rash in dengue the two uh, two patterns one is the erythematous diffuse rash or the uh, you know uh, the dengue toxic rash what we can say that is uh, uh, that is a different rash for which you don't need to do anything okay however the platelets uh, uh, when they drop further you can see the petechial rash that also can come and both of these are not suggestive of any significant bleeding so presence of platelets does not mean there is a bleeding so mucosal bleeding is yes but cutaneous like skin manifestations like petechi it's not significant bleeding and then, sir, going towards the lab story, increase in hematocrit and rapid decrease in platelet count. How do you define that? What is what is high hematocrit and what is rapid decrease in platelet? See, uh, uh, this is the, uh, I mean to say, the uh, uh, hematocrit, anything above 50 has to be considered significant. Okay. And rapid decrease in the platelet is more than 20% from the baseline. And you mean that is 20% every day, every 24 hours, right? Yes. Yes. So do you advocate checking platelets every 24 hours in these cases? Sorry? Do you advocate checking platelets every 24 hours in these cases? First, usually, I'm telling you most commonly is, let us say, uh, first uh, three to four days, usually the trend, what we say, the natural history of the dengue infection, let's talk about that first. So initially, you see the start is like low white cell count. So first your white cells count drop and followed by the platelets. So your platelets will go to a significant low level probably after day five. And your white cells start dropping uh, same time just before that. So now uh, why we, I don't know. I mean, the problem is we see everybody, if you see the dengue, they will first question us, what is the platelet count? However, it's a wrong notion. First of all, uh, platelets uh, are not as important as they are given importance in the management of dengue. Obviously, they drop, but the requirement of platelet transfusion is usually not there unless they drop to less than 10,000 or there is a significant bleeding that you see. Unless that happens, you are not supposed to transfuse platelets. Again, how much platelet transfusion is use, useful, that is not very, uh, you know, guideline-based or that is not uh, evidence based. Uh, there is not much evidence that platelet transfusion alone helps. There is a, a guidelines. If you see the guidelines, they recommend about blood transfusion in patients who have significant bleeding and if there is any shock. So, whole blood uh, or a factor RBCs has to be transfused in these patients. And yes, you can support with platelets, but that's not the whole. So, uh, uh, platelets alone is not important. You have to consider PRBC as well if there is a significant drop in the hemoglobin. So that has to be emphasized. Now, uh, the uh, how to monitor? The monitoring has to be for the hematocrit, not exactly for the platelet count. Why we need to monitor the hematocrit or let's say PCV is because you need to assess the intravascular volume of the patient because the complications happen because of the drop in the intravascular uh, volume, that hypovolemia. So to assess the third spacing, you see the hematocrit rising. If it rises uh, more than 50 or more than 20% from the baseline, that is a significant intravascular volume depletion and you need to be aggressive with your fluids. That is what is the take home message from this, why you need to monitor. So it's not for the drop in the platelets. So we need to drop HBPCV is what is normally recommended to see every day. Sir, what is the, the rationale behind hemoglobin dropping in, uh, in uh, dengue? Why would no. hemoglobin drop? Normally, no, there are two phases in this. In febrile phase and in critical phase, usually the hemoglobin rises because the third spacing of the fluid, normally because the capillaries become leaky, because of the dengue virus uh, infection, the fluid from the intravascular compartment goes into the third uh, space, uh, like pleural fluid or abdominal, uh, you know, intraperitoneal compartment. So that causes the uh, hemoconcentration. And that causes the rise in the hematocrit or the PCV. And that's why when you do a CBP, your hemoglobin rises. So, 
and uh, at some point and that is when in the initial critical phase however once you give the fluids it slowly improves so that is why when you are giving the fluids in dengue with warning signs or in patients with uh, uh, severe dengue you monitor hematocrit your target hematocrit should be less than 50 so that it ensures that your volume uh, intravascular volume is adequate and sir what is the how do we how do we put lfts into this equation for clinical clinical decision making other than other than saying it is bad usually uh, we it's common to see that uh, around two to three times elevation in the uh, liver enzymes particularly sgot and sgpt so but in severe dengue it can be very high sometimes let's say uh, more than 1000 that is the definition wise uh, you can say that liver enzymes, SGOT and SGPT, more than 1,000 is suggestive of a severe dengue. So you can see that how significant it is. There are many patients with dengue, if they have severe abdominal pain, it is possibly pointing towards hepatitis coexisting with the ascites. So you can, try, uh, you can monitor the LFTs in them. If they are seeing that there is a rise, progressive rise in the LFTs, that indicates hepatitis, possible coagulopathy, because that can cause the increase in the APTT and PTINR and possible hepatic failure. So this is why you need to be careful if there is a rising titer of the liver enzymes. And uh, are these liver enzymes by itself would suffice the criteria for admission or uh, there has to be clinical associated clinical syndrome along with it? Usually, they are associated with the clinical symptoms. If, let's say, for uh, two to three times admission, uh, rise in the platelet, uh, sorry, SGOT and SGPT should not be a reason for admission. However, if the patient, see, in general, if the patient has pro persistent fever for more than four days, or if he has any warning signs, that should be the criteria for admission in dengue. If somebody has fever for shorter duration, and if they are able to maintain their uh, uh, volume status with oral liquids, I don't think there is any requirement of uh, admission in the hospital. And sir, one question that I asked you during that day when I was talking to you, I'll ask you here uh, for my attendees to uh, hear. I asked you about role of antibiotics in these cases because... Uh, as you can see in this particular patient, the white cell count is 1,700, neutrophil count is 1,100. This, this uh, gentleman is having fever. It's day four. And while dengue serology is positive, I am worried about secondary bacterial infection. So is there a role for uh, antibiotics in these cases? Uh, usually not. Because this is uh, a febrile neutropenia by definition, though. In uh, patients, they, this this is due to the acute viral infection, and it is likely to recover. The febrile neutropenia, you need to give antibiotic prophylaxis or treatment. Let's say when you expect the neutropenia to persist for seven days or longer, or if it is due to the chemotherapy. So in so dengue, usually as a prophylactic, there is no role of either antibiotics, no role of any steroids or no role of even new kinds, or the uh, granulocytes colony stimulating factor, GCSF. No role of either of these three. And the rationale in these cases is because you expect this neutrophilia uh, to neutropenia to not persist for a long period of time. You expect it exactly. to improve within a day or two, right? Yes. Okay, okay. And, and uh, another reason why is it different from the conventional neutropenia that we commonly see in the... Uh, chemotherapy patient is because in those patients, the neutropenia usually coincides with the gut mucositis because their gut uh, mucosa gets eroded due to the chemotherapy. That's why they are highly uh, at risk for the gut translocation of the bacteria from, the, uh, from gut into the blood. That's the reason any fever in these cases, we take very seriously. It's a medical emergency, febrile neutropenia. Same time, it's not the pathology in dengue. That's why we don't treat it with antibiotics. Uh, thank you, sir. I'll just take a pause here to my attendees. I am sharing a PPT slide, what Pratik sir shared with me. This is some of the bullet points that he thought it is important for us to highlight. So. Uh, again, if you want to take a screenshot of it, they are very basic, but uh, uh, it kind of drives home the point. 
Pratik sir, asymptomatic uh, thrombocytopenia, it's a very, very commonly asked question. When to transfuse in this 23-year-old gentleman? Uh, I would wait if he's stable till 10,000 at least. Okay. And it depends on how the uh, patient is. So let's say if I'm seeing a steady rise in the white cell counts uh, for maybe a couple of days and it is reaching 10, but there is no fever, there are no other warning signs, he is comfortable, then I would even wait, even if it's slightly less than 10,000, maybe three, uh, maybe around seven, 8,000. But the, I know that uh, white cells have started improving and the platelets uh, are going to follow the trend. So I would wait even in that situation. But in general, for practical purposes, 10,000 should be your threshold without bleeding. Obviously, if there is a bleeding, probably you can consider it early. You can consider transfusing platelets only if there is not significant bleeding to cause a significant drop in the hematocrit. However, if there is a drop in the hematocrit and HB significant drop, make sure you transfuse PRBC or the whole blood. So, you know, I... I hear you uh, going down all the way down to 10,000 or 8,000 and whatnot. My question is, why to be that brave? Why not start transfusing at 20, 25,000? What is the harm? Uh, yes, there is definitely harm. First thing is, there is no evidence that platelet transfusion helps. That's one. Second, uh, any transfusion, especially in dengue, can cause uh, transfusion-associated lung injury or fluid overload. What happens is in dengue, there are different, see, we, we discussed about the hemoconcentration that happens, the third spacing of fluids in the critical phase, right? But when there is a recovery phase of dengue, all the fluid which has been, uh, uh, you know, uh, third spaced into the peritoneal cavity or let's say the uh, pleural fluid, it is reabsorbed back into the vascular compartment. And that is the time where you should be even more watchful about the fluids. So you give more fluids during the critical phase. You should be very aggressive with fluid management in dengue in critical phase. However, once the uh, critical phase is over, you should cut down your fluids rapidly because the fluid comes back into the vascular compartment. And in this time, if you give more fluids, they can go into the pulmonary edema. So that assessment of fluid status and the disease uh, stage is very important so that you can direct your fluids accordingly. So if you give additional flu, uh, let's say if the patient is relatively well, just because platelets are low and he's in recovery phase, you give more fluids, especially a colloid, let's uh, say the plasma or the uh, platelets, then the, you may push the patient in either, either into the pulmonary edema, he may have a transfusion associated lung injury itself. And platelets will not help you for more than 24 hours. The shelf life is very less. And when you transfuse, they will anyway will not last for more than 24 hours. So it doesn't help you anyway. So that's why the clinical assessment of the given patient at that point of time is very important. What stage, what is the current stage of illness? You mentioned about fluid resuscitation. Uh, what is your thought about giving IV fluids at home in those in this kind of patient subset? Uh, I wouldn't do that because if you think really the patient needs IV fluids, preferable to admit the patients and do it because you need. It's not a simple uh, IV fluid administration. It has to be very direct. In patients who are, in, let's say, a critical phase, you need to follow the CBC, uh, uh, the particularly the HBPCV every eight hours or 12 hours. Guidelines will say every six hours also. If it is really critical, you have to do that. So your uh, fluid uh, resuscitation depends on that because if it is a patient who is in severe volume depletion or in shock, you may have to give a lot of bolus fluids and then reduce accordingly uh, this thing because the fluids, there are different rates. If you read the guidelines, in the different phases of patient uh, scenario, there are different rates of uh, fluid administration on hourly basis. So that is very closely to be done. Ideally speaking, that's why if any patient who really needs fluids, better to admit. And am I sensing from what you are saying that when these patients are admitted, are you, are you uh, dumping fluid like more than three, four liters a day? Are you are you needing to dump that much fluid in the body? 
if the patient is not able to take orally, if he's throwing up and he's in a febrile or a critical phase, yes. Okay, and you think that three, four liters of fluid probably should be done uh, in the hospital rather than at home. That's probably better. Absolutely, option. yes. Okay, all right. Uh, I'm inviting any questions or comments from any of our attendees. We have covered most of the topics that uh, I highlighted uh, in my invite on the weekly huddle uh, WhatsApp group. But uh, if there are any questions or any comments or suggestions, uh, for what we have discussed so far, please feel free to unmute yourself, raise your hand, uh, or type in a uh, type in your question. And uh, Dr. Shankar, I actually was coming coming to you only, so I'm glad that you unmuted yourself. My question to you is: uh, first, your comments about this topic. You heard Dr. Pratik uh, give, sharing his thoughts. Uh, my question to you is the very last question that I asked Pratik, sir. Uh, IV fluids at home, why is Pratik sir not liking that? Because sometimes we do give IV fluids at home uh, because we don't want every patient to get admitted and everything else looks fine. What is your thought on it? Are are we going to harm them more? Shankar sir. I am audible. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You are very much audible. Ah. <laughs> uh, good evening to all. Uh, at the outset, uh, I congratulate and thank Dr. Uh, Anup Agarwal and Pranit uh, Palamuri uh, for restarting uh, uh, huddle session, uh, weekly huddle session. Uh, uh, Dr. Satish has covered uh, this dengue fever uh, at length. Uh, only thing is uh, uh, regarding IV fluids at home, because the monitoring is needed, as uh, suggested by Dr. Satish also, because uh, we should... Uh, uh, we should be very careful regarding the warning signs. So they will, uh, if they are uh, there, uh, because they should be closely monitored. And if they are there, uh, then uh, he will uh, pass on to, he will progress to severe dengue. So that's why, so IV fluids should be given uh, under so close supervision uh, by the healthcare personnel. And they say at the same time, uh, so, the platelet concentrate uh, in recent guidelines um, by the World Health Organization and PAHO, that is a Pan-American Health Organization, they have passed uh, uh, guidelines recently, uh, only one, two months back, uh, regarding the management of dengue. And this in this, uh, the platelet concentrate is not necessary irrespective of the uh, platelet count, uh, except if there are chances of bleeding or patients uh, progress to bleeding uh, conditions like uh, pregnancy. Uh, but in clinical practice, uh, when uh, at any amount of uh, this uh, platelet count, we, if the bleeding tendency, bleeding uh bleeding is there then we transfuse uh second thing is uh below 10000 uh without bleeding or uh, 20000 with the bleeding in clinical practice uh, we advocate uh, platelet rich concentrate uh, is DP. And at the same time, as the uh, platelet in so non patient regarding the bone marrow recovery. So, like uh, mean platelet volume and the uh, uh, platelet uh, distribution uh, width, PD, PDW, MPV, and platelet to large cell ratio because of the uh, young platelets or the immature platelets uh, will have pseudopodia and the larger in size. So, platelet to large cell ratio that is a plcr and immature platelet uh, function fraction actually immature platelet fraction so these uh, platelet indices uh, should also be monitored uh, uh, so that uh, we can find out uh, whether the patient is recovering uh, or not whether uh, that that indicates that the bone marrow recovery so apart from the platelet count uh, hb pv pcv 
or HCT, then this platelet indices also should be monitored so that uh, we'll be confident enough that the bone marrow is recovering. Thank you. And one more uh, this thing, Dengvaxia, mm, at present, uh, uh, we are not advocating, uh, but uh, in few other countries, uh, it is approved by even US, US FDA also. Uh, th three doses should be given, zero, six, and 12 months. Uh, especially uh, in the persons aged uh, uh, between 9 to 45, particularly 9 to 16 years of age, and uh, confirmed previous dengue infection. They should be infected uh, by, with the dengue virus previously. Uh, otherwise, we should examine whether they were infect, infected or not. Uh, then only we should give sec, uh, in the patients of secondary infection or uh, heterotypic infected patients only, we should advocate uh, this uh, dengue vaccine. Yeah. Uh, so the, there should be serological evidence of the zero positivity in these cases. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Satish has nicely covered, uh, nothing to add. Uh, only thing is the recent guidelines. So regarding uh, the crystallides, crystallides versus uh, colloids, but uh, the, all the guidelines, uh, they advocate it uh, crystallites only, normal saline, uh, the ringer lactate, uh, other than uh, only, except in uh, acidosis, uh, then 5% uh, dextrose and dextrose saline. But these can be, these are uh, crystallites that can be given uh, in the fluid management or resuscitation of uh, dengue patients. Uh, but uh, home care management, we should advocate uh, intense oral hydration regimen uh, we regularly follow this uh, holiday cigar formula. So, so first, to, uh, the 1 to 10 kg, we give 100 ml per kg body weight. Then uh, second, uh, 10 to uh, 11 to 20 kg, we give uh, 50 ml per kg body weight, 40 ml per kg body weight. Then uh, uh, next, uh, 21 to... Uh, any number, uh, we give 20 ml per kg body weight. This is the holiday cigar formula we follow in uh, hydration uh, or in the resuscitation of the patient uh, with the fluids, either orally or uh, parenterally. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anip. Shankar, sir, I have two questions for you. Number one, uh, talking about platelet transfusion, I'm fascinated with the discussion which is happening about 10,000 and 8,000. Uh, with the kind of setup that you are practicing in, a patient with dental admission, platelet count of 30,000. How difficult it is for you to convince the patient or the family that you don't need platelet transfusion? But oh, there, there, there are guidelines. Sir. There are, it is not the platelet count, but only the bleeding manifestations we should treat. So, thrombocytopenia alone is not the factor, but other factors also should be taken into criteria. The pathogenesis of this dengue is vasculopathy and coagulopathy. They should be tackled. Uh, so, definitely, the, but that's why I'm telling you, uh, telling... Uh, Though the guidelines they tell, uh, irrespective of the platelet count, there are no indication for the uh, platelet transfusion. But uh, in our clinical practice, if it is a 20,000 uh, platelet count with the uh, bleeding manifestations or less than 10,000 uh, platelet count, I transfuse uh, SDP. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I will go back to Pratik, sir. In the meantime, if anybody has any questions or comments, please feel free to share. Pratik, sir, uh, any any immunoglobulin that we have identified yet for dengue treatment? Any IVIG or anything that you know? Uh, no, uh, not uh, no, uh, no. Uh, Pratik, sir, one second. Somaraju, sir, please go ahead. Uh, uh, we have been listening to the experts and uh, some of you. Uh, as is uh, usual, 
uh, we in tertiary care do not seem to be interested in prevention. And uh, please do talk something about the practical aspects of prevention for many of us uh, who are not involved in this and also including the status of vaccine. Don't do the same mistakes you have been doing all our life. Please talk about prevention. Thank you, sir. Definitely, we will be talking about prevention uh, as we move forward. Uh, Pratik, sir, uh, IVIT for dengue fever. Uh, no data so far, no use. Uh, only in few scenarios, let's say sometimes when we see the dengue with HLH in that scenario, there may be some evidence, but nothing dengue specific IgG. It's just the routine IVIG. But in general cases, no use. Then the other question that Samuraju sir mentioned and Shankar sir also mentioned, what is what is your thought about uh, vaccine in India? You think you mentioned that there are reasons why it won't be applicable in the current form, but do you know any inside story of vaccine coming up for us? Yes, I mean see, the reason is first we don't have a very good clinical uh, sorry epidemiological data of zero types prevalent in India in different parts. Now India is a huge country. And there are different strains predominant in different areas. Like I mentioned, it is not effective against all four serotypes. And uh, like uh, Dr. Shankar mentioned, it is uh, a uh, vaccine which is useful only if somebody had dengue in the past. So you have to have a confirmed serology positive IgG, then only you should take vaccine of dengue. Otherwise, in patients who were not previously vaccinated, it has shown to increase the risk of hospital admissions and uh, severe dengue. So that is the risk. So if somebody gets primary dengue after dengue vaccine, the primary dengue infection works as if a secondary infection. And that's why you see more complications and more hospital admissions. So that's why it's a mandatory thing to know the serology prior to giving the dengue vaccine. So, and again, it is more useful in the pediatric, uh, I think, 9 to 15 or 16 years population. It is more useful. So it's not useful in across the age groups. So these are the different things which we need to know before advocating dengue vaccine. So this is the precise reason, though we have so many cases of dengue, the government is not launching the dengue or the ICMR is not approving the use of dengue in India because these are the practical roadblocks we have in uh, dengue management in India. So how to stratify that, who has been given, so you need to do a lot of testing. So that is the reason it is not being approved in India so far. And then sir, last question. Renu, uh, sorry for interruption. Uh, we, have, we went through similar situations with uh, COVID. Uh, our lack of information adequate, still we developed vaccinations. And also even H1N1, the, what we is available versus what is talked about, what is right, and uh, uh, yeah, while that information was not adequate, we still have vaccines for which there is no 100% uh, evidence of benefit. Still, uh, it helps 40 to 50% of the patients. So this argument, I don't agree, that it should not be made available just because you don't know enough information. Uh, um, I, I, so can I, I, can I uh, have yes. uh, this thing? Sorry, no. yes. we have information. It's not there. It's not. It's not that we don't have any information. But the problem with the dengue vaccine, particularly, is because it can backfire. We have mm -hmm. information about serotypes in certain areas. It is available. But only thing is, you have, before considering vaccination in the given a population, we have to do a lot of zero surveys and serological tests in all the vulnerable population. Now, if you see that vulnerable population, it's anybody. So in that case, so that is the reason government is not approving it yet. That's why it's not commercially available in India. At least if they make it available, as a private practice or those who want to go for it as an individual, we have a choice of doing that. Anybody eligible, if we do a test, if it's positive, probably we can still suggest those vaccines. But if we have an eligible population, we can use it. It's not that we cannot use it, but government for these reasons is not approving because they, it will involve a lot of work and probably a lot of funding. 
So Pratik sir, my question to you is, now I'm taking Somara Dusar side. Uh, see, when, when I was in my undergraduate in 2006, New Delhi saw a huge, epid, huge uh, endemicity of uh, dengue at that time. I remember at that time we catered to some 16,000, 18,000 dengue patients over a few days. Uh, that main Ames hospital literally was flooded. Every single bed had dengue at that time, something like what we saw in COVID. But of course, uh, because dengue was more regional, it was not, it was not spread out in all across India but there were few pockets. Uh, we have been hearing dengue since we entered medicine. And there had been these episodes of these blasts of dengue all across. I certainly can, can see that even government would see the urgency of why we need to work on dengue. Is there something fundamentally difficult about this virus like HIV where we are not able to come up with a virus or you think it is pure lack of funding intent or whatnot? What is your thoughts on this? I think the dengue vaccine is reasonably good vaccine against in if you are using it in a given population and in a given setting. It's much probably much better in terms of the immunogenicity. However, it's the different serotypes that you have and it is not effective against all serotypes. I'm not sure about why it is not good enough and what is the exact immunological mechanism of different response to the different serotypes. I cannot, I'm not aware about that. So it is not a very useful uh, vaccine as compared to the uh, uh, flu vaccine or this thing. There is no uh, uh, efficacy. So probably when you see government, always there is a risk versus benefit or cost benefit uh, that they have to consider. So as of right now, even if I want a dengue vaccine, uh, it's not available in India, correct? It's not. It's not. So that is what I was trying to make a point. At least if government permits to be available, to make it available, it need not be available under the uh, government should not give it on their from their pocket. For those who are interested, they are eligible and ready to pay for it. I think it is fair enough to make it available. And because we don't know much about the vaccine as much as you do, uh, particularly for dengue and the vaccine both, uh, let us say if this situation does come where mm -hmm. vaccines are available at purchase uh, on an individual, based upon your current level of understanding, do you think you would recommend all of us to get our IgG level checked and after that get the vaccine done? What is your, what is your take on that? Uh, probably yes. See, again, okay. it depends on how, what is your risk. So benefit is not seen. See, that is the reason, again, government is not approving it for all because the benefit is best seen in the small population in certain age group, young age group. It's not seen across the uh, different age groups. But uh, what is the harm? We don't know in this population. There are not very big studies to say what is possibly but like we uh, sir said we have used covid vaccine without much information why not dengue a point taken i think it's fair enough we can try it out to those who are willing uh, at least they will be registered as a trial we can try it not why not thank you pratik sir uh Sumaradu, sir i do have a couple of questions for you you shared your thoughts on the topic today my two questions pertaining to dengue and cardiology so this 23-year-old gentleman who is post-bypass surgery, he takes a low-dose aspirin daily. In the context of dengue, uh, or dengue, what is your thought on uh, aspirin and thrombocytopenia? At what point do you think it should be mandatorily stopped? Or you think there is no platelet count at which we have to stop in this, these kind of cases? What is your thought on it, Samaraju, sir? Uh, if it is post-bypass surgery, is it? Yes. Yes, sir. When was the surgery done? Surgery was done six years ago, sir. So if it is bypass surgery, the answer was simple, straightforward. Uh, be uh, more conservative and say, stop the medication, uh, aspirin or any antiplatelet. The issues are more difficult with angioplasty, uh, recently done, etc. And uh, there you have to go by what Dr. Pratik said, wait for the platelet counts to come because the risk of thrombosis versus the risk of uh, uh, serious complications so with dengue you have to weigh each individual patient you have to go by that and more than one of us should be involved in it 
do keep in touch with the physician or a infectious disease specialist and work together. Uh, the more difficult question, as I said, is in the setting of uh, say previous stenting and the duration of stenting, etc. And uh, most fibrous surgery is simple, straightforward. The moment you have a confirmation of dengue, whatever is the platelet count, I will stop antiplatelets. Thank you. And sir, the second question pertaining to cardiology comes not for this patient, but uh, very recently uh, there was a patient in our ICU, uh, medical ICU. She, I believe, uh, is 27, 28 year old female with uh, all the dengue features that we talked about, uh, but severe myocarditis with the ejection fraction noted to be around 30, 35% global hypokinesia and uh, she was requiring inotropes and whatnot to maintain. She did come out of uh, her uh, acute episode, but uh, I was scratching my head that, is there something dengue is specific that we can do to help this kind of myocarditis patient other than supportive care? Samaraj, sir. Uh, I'm sorry, um, I don't know all the answer for it. Uh, Pratik, sir, anything dengue myocarditis? This may not be a question for you, but uh, do you expect us to do anything other than the routine supportive care? Uh, no, I don't think anything particular as such. Nothing. It's just the routine supportive care. Wait for it to recover on its own. So I remember back in the day where uh, viral myocarditis, not particularly dengue myocarditis, where we have bridged these patients with... Uh, mechanical, uh, external mechanical support devices for a few days to even weeks or two, uh, just so that like what we were doing in uh, COVID, we were doing with ECMO for lungs. Here, uh, we have done it for mechanical support device for the, for the left ventricle and sometimes for right ventricle as well, for those ventricles to recover. And that typically uh, we end up doing when uh, the cardiac output is so low even while being on inotropes and whatnot that we are not able to maintain forward perfusion. So in those cases, while we wait for the viral phase to, to recover, uh, we have to support the hemodynamics and that often uh, requires uh, mechanical support. Uh, I'm glad that uh, that wasn't the case, at least uh, in my short uh, professional career, it wasn't more than a few times but I'm pretty sure to my seniors, they, they probably have seen more than a few times where patients required uh, external mechanical support to tide over the crisis, as to speak. Uh, those were all the topics that I had. And Pratik, sir, one question I didn't ask. Uh, so what kind of IV fluids you give to your patients if they're admitted in the hospital? Do you have a standard protocol? Like uh, I think Dr. Shankar mentioned, it's the crystallides, uh, which is the drug, I mean, the fluid of choice. It can be just an, a normal saline or in some cases, uh, uh, the plasma light, which is used commonly, which is more physiological fluid, we can say. Uh, these are the crystalloids are preferred. We usually don't use the other uh, colloids unless somebody is in a refractory shock. So that's what I would say, crystalloids. And there is nothing like plasma light is better than uh, ringer lactate is better than normal saline, nothing like that, right? No, if you are giving too much and if there is a patient is not able to, uh, uh, if the patient is looking acidotic, the only risk factor with the normal saline is the hyperchloremic acidosis. If the patient is looking all right overall, then you don't need to worry. Plasma light is a better option, especially in critical patients who are in the ICU. Uh, but again, it's an uh, additional cost. So if it's a ward patient, probably simple normal saline or ringer lactate should be fine. Uh, in ICUs, probably you can prefer plasma light. Thank you so much, sir. It is 8.04. Any other questions, comments about today's discussion that uh, we can hear from you or we can ask uh, Pratik, sir, uh, for his comments? Maybe just a few seconds. I'll take a pause. If you have any questions, you can please share. And let me take this opportunity to thank each one of you for participating. This is our 119th session. And we already have the schedule out for this month, which is November. Uh, as you know, we have been doing this for quite some time every Wednesday. Earlier, we were starting at 7 p.m. Now we're starting at 8 p.m. Uh, as per the feedback that I have got. And uh, I'm trying to make sure that we do have few 
uh, media outputs either in the form of flowcharts or uh, PowerPoint, which we can share it with you. Uh, the basic premise of Huddle was not to make it a presentation, not to have a PowerPoint where you do a 30 minute presentation because that you attend plenty. The idea of uh, the Huddle was to have a more interactive session where we go beyond the science, where we talk about what we can do practically and whatnot. So thank you all for bearing with me. Uh, all these sessions I'm recording and I'm actively putting it on our YouTube channel and our podcast. Uh, I am running behind schedule, but I'm trying to put one video, one session recording every three or four days. So maybe in the next one month or so, I'll catch up. And then hopefully I will be able to uh, put a live recording uh, on the YouTube as well. So thank you all for attending uh, today's session. We will be back live next Wednesday at eight o'clock. And uh, I don't know if Pranith is uh, logged in yet. Pranith, if you are, you can probably say one last word before we close the session. Yeah, I'm there. Uh, uh, thank you. And uh, I've there since a uh, few of the last discussion. It's good to be back. It's always uh, nice to hear uh, the practical aspects of managing. Uh, thank you for the inputs from Dr. Pratik and Shankar, sir. Uh, I think it was a, a very interactive session. And hopefully with this session, our... Um, strategy of managing dengue will be a bit better and a bit more confident. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Good night. We will see you next Wednesday. Take care, guys. Thank you. Bye.